Thanks. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Marty. Um, so uh, I uh, studied uh, statistics and econometrics at UC Berkeley Business School back in the late 80s um, and in the statistics department. Um, I focused on time series analysis. Uh, so what I am is a forecaster uh, with, a, with a track record on forecasting. Um, I studied uh, Fourier analysis and Box Jenkins uh, auto regressive integrated moving average models. Um, and uh, uh, I, I was hired um, into Solomon Brothers in 1986 by Laszlo Barini. And um, uh, I was at Solomon for about five or six years. I ended up in proprietary trading. I was a quantitative strategist in prop trading. Um, the last few years I was there, and I guess my primary claim to fame was getting the top in the Japanese market right, uh, and we got we really nailed that in the uh, prop trading department at Solomon. So since uh, I left Solomon at the end of 1991, and I started the Belkin Report 1992, so it's been 30 years now. Um, the Belkin Report is a forecasting service again based on econometrics. Now, let me tell you what the model does. So I have a unique proprietary model that's it's based on the mathematics that I studied of, of Fourier and Box Jenkins uh, models. Uh, it's different though. So what the model does, is it gives direction, position, and intensity. It's not like a regression model that gives you an expected value of something. It gives you direction, up, down, or neutral, position, beginning, middle, end, and intensity or confidence interval. Direction, position, intensity. And um, that's in a 12 period forward forecast. So I'm not looking in the rearview mirror or looking at a chart that ends today. I'm always looking at what happens next. So that's what clients, I have a, my client base is a, you know, a lot of hedge funds, uh, private family offices, sovereign wealth funds, big asset managers on the bond side, equity side, you name it. Uh, I have clients um, all over the place. Um, private equity firm. Uh, uh, I just saw, uh, you know, one of the household name top private equity firm, long uh, senior, very senior person there is one of my clients. So what I do is forecasting, and um, so that's that's side of the capsule. We don't have all day here, I, 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 so I don't have really time to get into the model. But just know this: it's based on a forecast of direction, position, intensity using weekly and monthly data. So um, now let's cut to the chase. So the beginning of the year my long-term model using monthly data. So 12 period forward forecast, that's 12 months, one year forward forecast, beginning of the year, everything turned down for, um, that would be the stock market, the S&P earnings, the economy, everything like that. So we're basically in a, uh, a period of contraction. And uh, I'd like to put that in perspective. So as well as having the, Statistical forecast, which everything I do is based on. I'm, I also wear the investment strategist hat. So how does it all fit together? Since I've been doing this for 30 years, it's not just a black box thing. It's like, what is, what's going out there and what's going on out there in the world? What are central banks doing? Where's the economy headed? You know, what's likely? So if we could, uh, Marty, if you could put up the first um, uh, chart from my handout. Um, all right, give me one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a slideshow. Just give me a second. Okay. so. Um, Basically, uh, what we're coming out of is a, a period of insane. Uh, if you could slide it down so we can see the chart, please, on the screen. Like, uh, just I'm go. I'm doing it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's total stimulus. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but this is comparing total stimulus as a percent of GDP in the after the COVID crisis in 2020 versus 2009, 2008, and um. So what we had is the left is the is is the latest example. The right is back in 2008, 2009. So we had 9.5 trillion dollars of stimulus. That's five trillion of fiscal stimulus, 4.5 trillion of monetary stimulus. That's Fed balance sheet. That's 38 percent of GDP. That's so ginormous. Like so, compared to 2008, 2009, which is the green thing on the right, that's 14, say 15 percent of GDP. So it's 2.6 times more stimulus after COVID. And so let's just think about that for a second. Um, you know, the crisis hit and you had all these uh, dire predictions. Talk about, um, you know, you had epidemiologists saying we're all going to die of plague, people dying in the streets, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what did the authorities do? They freaked out. Um, they, they, they locked everything down. I would say the lockdown was more of a big deal than the actual COVID crisis. So, um, so they had to add all this stimulus. 
So um, just that's very, very important because now the stimulus is over. So what we had is a stimulus bubble, which I was very bullish on. The model is, you know, back in 2000, I turned 2020, March, the model turned bullish on the stock market. It was bullish for 18 months. And, it, you know, I also do, uh, the model is very good on sector analysis. We'll get to that in a second. But if we slide down, let's just get, let's just get the big picture. Next uh, chart, please. Um, S&P earnings. So here's S&P 500 earnings according to Standard & Poor's quarterly earnings. Um, so you can see at the, I think, here's my interpretation. We had a sugar high in earnings. So that came from stimulus. And now the stimulus is gone, okay, right? Remember, no more stimulus, just dribs and drabs fiscal, the Fed's in contraction doing QT instead of Q, QE. <clears throat> so um, let me just give you the numbers that, that, top, that peak earnings for S&P quarterly earnings, according to Standard & Poor's operating earnings, Q4, 56.73, Q1, 49.36, Q2 just finished reporting 46.97. So we're down 10% year over year in quarterly earnings. You don't see that on fact set. This is like the only place you're gonna hear that. Nobody else is talking about this yet. Mark, even the people that are bearish supposedly on earnings I don't think, I think they don't really understand what's going on. So we're down 17% year to date in quarterly earnings, not annual earnings. So if you annualize the current earnings, which are right around 47 bucks, that's 187 versus the consensus of on Wall Street, which is 227. So we're way below what the consensus is just totally out to lunch. And so my forecast, you notice what happens is the 200 month average, when you get these huge, um, diversions from trend, like we've had, where do you go in the contraction phase? You go back to the 200 month average. It's just a simple trend analysis thing. It's not brain surgery, but you get down to that level. And um, just to put that in perspective, it's 28 bucks for S&P earnings, which annualizes at 112. So that is my forecast. It sounds wildly contrarian, but it's not that really ridiculous sounding compared to what happens and long-term contractions. So earnings down, which implies, you know, that if consensus earnings are looking for 227 or 230 or something this year, um, I'm just so far below that. In other words, that PE, the forward PE of the market is twice as high as what people are telling you. Next, if we could slide down to the next chart, please. Um, so margin debt, just down on that same page. Yeah, oops, back, let, well, you go back up to the, Pre previous chart on the bottom of that, that next one, previous back. Back up? Yeah, that's good, right there. Margin debt. <clears throat> okay, so margin debt peak was 935 billion, sugar high, right? The Fed, they printed all this money, people got bullish on the market, they voted up, got leveraged. Uh, we're down to 697 billion, we're about halfway down. Notice the 200 month average, that's where we're headed, that's where we got in 2009, deleveraging. 466 billion in margin debt. That's the 200 month average, just down 30 something percent from here. So we're about halfway down in a deleveraging phenomenon. Next chart, please. Um, NASDAQ 100. So you can see left hand side of this chart. Where did we get in 2000? At, uh, basically back to 2009. I it says 2007, that's wrong. 2009 low. Um, we got to the 200 month average. It's just standard mean reversion in an economic contraction. So where is that number? Um, that number's down 58% for the NASDAQ 100. So I'm not saying today or tomorrow or this week or next month or this year, but 12, 18 months target before this contraction is over, the market could easily get cut in half. Uh, next, just slide down to the S&P 500 right below that. And, and Michael, is, it, is this the assumption that we're, the Fed will do nothing about this or? Um, well, what, let me get there. I'll under get under current second. Fed policy? Yeah, so um, so let, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a second, the economy and the Fed. Just let me, let's just race through these charts. Also. Okay, keep on going. So S&P 500, that's down. Um, 2110, which is down about 46% from the current level. And again, look at 2002, left-hand side of this chart, 2009, we got there. Bear markets, mm -hmm. long-term cyclical bear markets, you get there. Ballpark. I mean, it's not a precise, it's not brain surgery. It's not exact number. But um, in other words, there's a lot, there's basically 
the market could be cut in half before this bear market is over. Um, next chart, please. Uh, top one, Bitcoin. Um, okay, Bitcoin. By the way, I'm not a perma bear at all. Like you might, don't get that uh, impression from what I'm showing you. I would be delighted to go bullish. I, I depend on the model. The model is unbiased. I do not want to be biased. I'm not bearish or bullish. I don't have that bias I'm, I'm with the model, whatever the model says, right? Okay, so uh, the Bitcoin bubble, just like everything else, uh, could go down another almost 70%, 6,190. Where are we now? We're 18,900. So I would love to be bullish on Bitcoin, but not here. We're in the middle of a liquidation. You can slide down to the next chart. And uh, this kind of puts things in perspective. This is bonds. Okay, now everything I've been telling you about the 200 month average, notice we're not there yet in stocks, earnings, uh, Bitcoin, but guess what's already there? The T-bond future. So the T-bonds peaked right about the time the Fed started doing QE. This was back on a spike in, uh, I believe May, April, May, 2020. So we, they've been in a bear market. So bonds, treasury bonds here, have been in a bear market for a long time, for 18 months, you know? Um, and where did they get to? They got to the 200 month average. So I, um, I will, I don't have time to go through everything, but um, uh, I guess we can go back to me now. Um, that's enough for the chart screen. And- um, Okay, well, give me one second here. Yeah. Um, you can download this, this chart package. By the way, the Belkin Report, I stuck, uh, I appended the latest edition of the Belkin Report, which is a 13 page report to the end of that handout. And you can, I won't go, through, there's not enough time to go through everything in it, but um, let, let me just summarize what's going on. We're in an economic contraction that's going to continue for 12, 18 months minimum. It was created by excessive stimulus. Now that the stimulus is pulled, we're like the coyote and the roadrunner with the coyote going off the cliff and his legs are still spinning in the air. He's starting to go down. It's not the end of the world. I'm not predicting the 1930s depression. Who knows, it could be something like that. I'm just saying standard economic cycle stuff. So one of the first things I studied at Solomon Brothers was what happens to stocks in recessions? And da 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 guess what? They go down. They go down because earnings go down. And um, that's the oldest story on Wall Street. You know, we get uh, retail sales start declining. Companies start cutting back on production. Then there's this a uh, cascade of order cancellations. So we're already seeing that the leading economic indicators, that's PMI, things like that. Um, uh, those are in recession territory already. The S&P market uh, composite um, uh, uh, PMI, that's services and manufacturing, two months below 50. So that's a leading indicator. We're already kind of in the early stages of a recession, probably. The things that the Fed responds to, now the Fed's mandate, remember, is inflation and employment. Those are both lagging indicators, okay? Um, so the Fed by design or by, I don't know, not by design, by, by mandate is, is pledged to, to respond to lagging economic indicators, which will move at the end of this. So, in, uh, un, you know, the unemployment rate has barely started going up. You know, there's still lots of jobs. That's a lagging indicator, right? That will look terrible at the bottom. So the pattern of the stock market over the economic cycle is to peak out before a recession. I did a, a presentation on this for the um, uh, Seattle CFA Society a couple of years ago. Um, anyways, the stocks, you, the, S the stock indexes typically peak a few months before a recession starts, although you don't know precisely what that date is until later. So you have to have you know, look at the leading indicators to realize you're in a real-time recession. And then it bottoms at the bottom before uh, things start looking good and the market starts going up and before there's any good news. And um, so what does that tell you? It goes back to like, one of my favorite uh, investors of all time is Sir John Templeton. His famous uh, quote was, buy at the point of maximum pessimism sell at the point of maximum optimism. And um, so to get back to your, to your question, uh, Marty, yeah, I think the Fed, um, right now they're tightening, they let inflation get out of control. But by the way, let me just put that in perspective here. Um, <clears throat> so um, 
crude oil and base metals, crude oil is down 27% from its peak. Base metals on average are down 37%. That goes back to six months ago. So the things, the, the PPI kind of things that fueled inflation, which was created, of course, by excess monetary creation and excess fiscal stimulus, those, uh, that stuff's already started going down big time, which is a sign of economic weakness. So it, it's, and I have a peak in, in inflation in the model forecast. So rate of change, CPI, PPI peaking. That doesn't mean we're going down to 2% inflation. I'm not saying that. Just saying the, the inflation is going to stop going up. It's spreading into services and companies are raising prices. It's not like it's gonna go away, go away anytime soon, you wave a magic wand. But um, uh, anyways, base metals, crude oil, things like that, commodities already in, in, a, in a severe bear market. Now, um, so the, the, the stock market typically doesn't bottom in this cycle, in this long-term cycle process until the Fed starts cutting interest rates. Okay, it usually takes a few interest rate cuts before um, the stock market bottoms and starts going up. So believe me, I'm, I'm on alert for that, but that's so far out right now, you know, we're gonna have a 75 basis point increase probably, you know, this in the next week or whenever the Fed meeting is in September. Um, so we have some more Fed rate hawks to get and, and uh, that's coming up. Um, but let me explain what's going on in the market. So the S&P, so far year to date, the NASDAQ's down 27%, okay? S&P is down 19%. Um, uh, but that's been interspersed by these huge swings. So bear markets go like a lightning bolt, you know, they go zigzag, it's like a zigzag thing. So from, we've had four or five of these things now. So January 3rd to March 14th, NASDAQ down 21%. March 14th to March 29th, really quick, up 17%. March 29th to June 16th, down 27%. June 16th to August 15th, plus 23%. That was three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. And now we're down 12% from there. So even though we're down 27%, we've had these 20% up, 20% down, uh, it, you know, uh, zigzag things. That's typical for a bear market. And consensus sentiment is just basically on the wrong. Basically, people are getting really bearish at the bottom, getting short, then they get squeezed, it goes up. And then there's all these stories now, hedge funds bought into tech, you know, in August, and now we're down, you know, um, we're down 12% in the NASDAQ. So um, consensus sentiment can get whipsawed really badly. So he, here's what I'd recommend. I, um, I, I, I'm sort of running out of time. I just like to give my, um, my uh, what I am telling people to do now, private family offices, I have several big, you know, billionaire family offices, and here's what I'm telling them to do. Um, <clears throat> It be short the market, but do not sell in the hole. So right now, um, I think the market's going down. We're maybe halfway through this intermediate term move, I know, but the longer term trend is down. So I think um, I like put wow. options right here. Uh, option, uh, they, there's been big sellers of volatility. NASDAQ put options, December 270 puts. Um, I think the volatilities are still affordable enough. That probably won't last. Uh, but you don't want to get married. Uh, generally, I do not recommend um, options because time decay works against you. It's usually a horrible investment. However, when you're having in a, in a bear market like this, where you're having these big percentage moves back and forth, you can trade them, um, you know, using options, but do not get stuck holding them. So I think maybe a three, four, six week view, put options on the NASDAQ. I like it. Um, I told you bonds, I've got to be the only... <laughs> advisor everybody there's huge short positions there's 1.4 million large spec shorts spread up um, in the commitments of traders reports across 30 year 10 year and five year uh, bond futures and um, the macro traders which have actually been the only uh, hedge fund strategy that's actually worked this year for the most part um, most a lot of hedge funds are down on the year you know stock pickers are not getting not really doing that well um, but um, the, all the macro guys are really short bonds and long the dollar. Um, I, uh, I'm not long the dollar anymore, except for versus the Chinese yuan. I think that the Chinese yuan is going to weaken. Um, I think the DXY index is probably topping. So it looks really like a bad trade right now, but I think it's overdone. And um, uh, so dollar probably topping, bonds probably bottoming. 
Um, lot, that's only treasuries, only long-term treasuries. Obviously, the Fed's going to raise rates. It's going to affect the short end, two-year, things like that. Not a good place to be. Um, so how could the bonds rally? It's, that's not what the Fed wants at all, right? That, I mean, that's horrible for them. But why would they rally? Economic weakness, economic cycle down. They've already had the bear market, the stocks that I'm predicting for stocks, already below the 200-month average. So it's not like I'm, you know, bonds are not, it's the, it's one of the only things, you know, the, the cleanest dirty shirt out there or something at the moment. Um, what, so if you're a private family office, um, there are things you can do. Uh, now, Marty asked me to talk about the sectors. The model is particularly strong on sector rotation. So sector, my long-term forecast, I run everything ratios, utilities and consumer staples. And that's XLU, XLP in ETFs. Those have a huge outperformed long-term forecast. That's the only part of the market I would want to be in. But it's not an absolute return. It's only outperformed. So it's like a chicken long. So you buy ut utilities and consumer staples. What has the weakest forecast? Tech. So tech, which is, of course, and consumer discretionary, have the largest holdings of hedge funds. Um, it's the go-go high beta thing. You know, it's the thing that people want to own, ARC funds, you know, things like that. So um, uh, tech has a huge underperformed forecast. So what do you do? Be very careful out there. Look out for, a, uh, for big swings in the market. You can trade them for a trade, but right now that trade is down and the long-term trade is down. And this thing probably won't bottom until it looks like the end of the world, which according to you know Sir John Templeton's buy at the point of maximum pessimism, that might not happen for another 12 months or so. But um, you wanna be there and have cash to buy, to scoop things up when, they're, when things look like a disaster. In the meantime, just be careful, maybe put some <coughs> NASDAQ, nip long bonds, uh, trade the swings, but do not get caught in the long-term liquidation uh, of the stock market during a economic contraction. Hey, hey Michael. So uh, I, I have three minutes left, and I've got three questions for you. So that gives you about forty-five seconds to answer each one. Okay. Right. So, uh, there's still a lot of stimulus on the balance sheet. It's not. It's not over. What are your thoughts in forty-five seconds or less? Uh, it's going off. I track the Fed's balance sheet every week. Uh, it's they. They are. They've cranked the. Um, the quantitative tightening up to 90 billion a month starting in September. So it's, it's, we're in contraction on the mm -hmm. Fed balance sheet. Uh, simple, it's already started. So the money's sitting there, but they're not adding anymore for sure. And it's going into slow motion contraction. I think at some point they'll panic and we'll get into another, you know, when the economy looks terrible, the stock market crashes or something, the Fed will reverse course. We're, not, we're nowhere near that point yet. Um. One second. Um, is there anything that can stop the sell-off that you are forecasting and many others? Is that a Fed um, intervention? I think the, the, getting back to the first chart the, um, of this, how much stimulus, you, we just can't get away from this stimulus pile, this unnecessary <laughs> stimulus, the, and the, the elimination of it. It's made markets into a sugar high and the economy into a sugar high. And for every action, there's a reaction. And the reaction to this for the free market is a liquidation of the excesses of the bubble. So they created a stimulus bubble and we're in the liquidation. I I'm just have to stick with what the model says. The long-term forecast is down for the economy, retail sales, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and for the stock market and for margin debt, we're in a deleveraging. Great, uh, one question for the audience here. Thanks, Michael, it's Rob Cohen. Question, are you seeing more interest in private versus public or other types of convert structures just given the downturn? Okay, well, I'm not a big expert, but I, I do have an anecdotal story to tell you that's kind of funny. So I, I was in New York a couple months ago at having breakfast at the Pierre Hotel with a senior executive at a very top private equity firm. And I showed him, I gave a similar presentation to what I just given you to him. And he's been my client for literally decades. I, I don't want to disclose who or what, but um, I showed him it, and he was most concerned about the price of the stock that he gets paid in from the private equity firm. So we were we were spent a lot of the of the breakfast figuring out how ways ways that he could hedge his exposure 
to private equity to the elevated stock in this uh, public private equity firm. So that's that's the only uh, insight I have. It, it, the best that insight. sounds really that sounds extremely reasonable. I have time for a thirty second question. Does anybody have any other questions here? Fantastic, great. You know, Michael, it, it's it's uh, it's fascinating. Um, so uh, we're going to have some speakers talking about credit uh, tomorrow. We'll have Randy Cohen, who's a professor at Harvard and 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 runs a liquid private equity fund. And we're also going to have Michael Oliver speaking, who runs in economics uh, forecasting. He's not Michael Oliver Weinberg, who's also here, but Michael Oliver. And uh, he's going to be speaking about um, uh, his economic forecast in Europe and China and commodities. You know, but our big fear, I think, as a group is contagion, right? Where, where as Fed pulls back dollars and there's all this dollar denominated debt all around the world. And how are they going to, how's it going to get paid if the dollars just aren't there, right? So that's that's the big fear on a global basis, and 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 Europe right now is suffering greatly. I mean, there's no doubt they're in recession, and as long as energy prices are as high as they are, it's it's going to be pretty bad. So, great yeah. job, Michael. We'd love to have you back at some point in the future talking more about credit markets. Uh, but we'll I'll talk about that offline to you and to Mark. All right, great job. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.